Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. And we turn in our hymnals and unit to the short story study to page 270, 271, the uh, Josefina Nigli text, The Street of the Canyon. I want to actually begin, though, a page back on 269 in 2B. Uh, we're going to be looking at two titles together, by the way. The first of these is The uh, Street of the Canyon, and the second is The Ray Bradbury, There Will Come Soft Rain. So we'll get to that one. I want to start, though, at 2B with this setting. So jot this one down. In the exposition, that is to say at the beginning of a story, yes, when we're talking about plot, we have what's called the setting. Now, exactly what is it that we're talking about, and why does it matter? Let's pay attention to a couple of bullet points here. The time, the place of a story's events are called its setting. To establish a setting, uh, writers use description. Make sure both words are there uh, for you. Uh, creating word pictures that appeal to the senses. Setting shapes stories in a few ways. One, setting may affect a story's plot. The story set in the Arctic wilderness, for example, characters will face challenges not found in a Caribbean resort hotel. Two, a well-described setting helps readers understand the time, the place of the action in a story. For example, a character from medieval times might be concerned with preserving his honor. A character from the Stone Age, however, might be concerned only with survival. Before reading either selection that's coming here, consult the author biographies and background notes. Then, Consider the way the setting of the story reflects the time period in which it was written. That will be significant in some of the uh, assessment writing that we'll be doing later. And you do have a, a chart here to help you. By the way, we also will continue to make inferences a conclusion that you reach based on evidence about information that's not stated in directly the text. On 270, we want to make sure that our vocabulary uh, study is happening for us. Let's talk about Josefina Nigli just for a moment. Note your dates. 1910 to 1983 are her dates. Born in Monterey, Mexico, she grew up on both sides of the border between Mexico and the United States. When Nigley was 15, her parents sent her to San Antonio, Texas to attend school. She published her first book shortly after her high school graduation. Later, she wrote plays. She found theater thrilling. She once said, once you have, quote, once you have experienced the emotion of having a play produced, you are forever lost to the ordinary world, end quote. Later, Nigley worked on, a, on movie scripts in Hollywood. In 1945, she published Mexican Village, a collection of ten stories that capture the rich local color of Mexico. While still in college, by the way, she won several prizes for her writing. Now, the background for this story, courtship and marriage in old Mexico. I'm reading with you on 271. Historically, in some parts of Mexico, a man had to ask a woman's family for permission to marry her. In other words, the parents arranged the match. In the town, in this story, a man and woman are considered engaged if they walk together in the plaza. Now, it's interesting. Sophomores have sometimes pointed out, dude, what is up with this? We have so few titles. I mean, we are sophomores after all. We have so few titles that have anything to do with love. Guys and girls, guys and girls. And I suppose that by the time we hit the second unit, we have to maybe give some consideration to a question like that. So let's put it in our notes at level one. To what degree, question, question, I'm going to ask you to answer this at the end of our study. To what degree is this a love story? Okay, so write that down. To what degree is this a love story? And I want you to consider the cultural significance of what we're looking at here, okay, as we work through level one. All right? So let's enjoy the story. Again, the challenge in our sophomore year. The challenge is to actually try to read along with the professional reader to pay as close attention as we can to improve our reading comprehension and fluidity. Here we go. Let's see if we can uh, get through this uh, text. Learn a few things on the way. The Street of the Canyon by Josefina Nigli. It was May. The flowering thorn was sweet in the air, and the village of San Juan Iglesias in the Valley of the Three Marys was celebrating. The long, dark streets were empty because all of the people, from the lowest paid cowboy to the mayor, were helping Don Romeo Calderon celebrate his daughter's 18th birthday. On the other side of the town, where the canyon road led across the mountains to the Sabinas Valley, a tall, slender man, a package clutched tightly against his side, slipped from shadow to shadow. Once the dog barked, and the man's black suit merged into the blackness of a wall. But no voice called out, and after a moment, he slid into the narrow, dirt-packed street again. The moonlight touched his shoulder and spilled across his narrow hips. He was young, no more than 25, and his black, curly head was bare. 
He walked swiftly along, heading always for the distant sound of guitar and flute. If he met anyone now, who could say from which direction he had come? He might be a trader from Monterey, or a buyer of cow's milk from farther north in the valley of the Three Marys. Who would guess that an Hidalgo man dared to walk alone in the moonlit streets of San Juan Iglesias? All right, let's pause. Let's write it down at level one. Uh, I'm going to pause for a moment, actually, though, and have you jump to, uh, to B for just a moment. In, when we think about story writing, there's basically two types of stories. So write this down, because I'm going to come back to it again and again as we talk more about these stories. There's basically two kinds of stories. One, hero takes a journey. Two, stranger comes to town. Now, write both of those down, and we'll talk a little about how both of them work. Hero takes a journey we know of, of course, in the greatest archetype of them all in Odysseus's journey. Yes, the Odyssey as we studied it in our freshman year. Stranger comes to town. This is a classic example of that. So notice we have a party. Everybody's there. We have a young 18-year-old girl's birthday. And then all of a sudden, this stranger shows up. Nobody knows where he came from. Nobody knows who he is. He's obviously a pretty handsome guy. Right? Nobody knows why he's here. Watch how the story kind of unfolds in that regard. Here we go. Enjoy now what happens next. Carefully adjusting his flat package so that it was not too prominent, he squared his shoulders and walked jauntily across the street to the laughter-filled house. Little boys packed in the doorway made way for him, smiling and nodding to him. The long, narrow room with the orchestra at one end was filled with whirling dancers, Rigid back chaperones were gossiping together, seated in their straight chairs against the plaster walls. Over the scene was the yellow glow of kerosene lanterns, and the air was hot with the too sweet perfume of gardenias, tube roses, and the pungent scent of close packed humanity. The man in the doorway, while trying to appear at ease, was carefully examining every smiling face. If just one person recognized him, the room would turn on him like a den of snarling mountain cats. But so far, all the laughter, dancing eyes were friendly. Suddenly, a plump, officious little man, his round cheeks glistening with perspiration, pushed his way through the crowd. His voice, many times too large for his small body, boomed at the man in the doorway. Welcome, stranger. Welcome to our house. Thrusting his arm through the strangers and almost dislodging the package, he started to lead the way through the maze of dancers. Come and drink a toast to my daughter, to my beautiful Sarita. She is 18 this night. In the square patio, the gentle breeze ruffled the pink and white oleander bushes. A long table set up on sawhorses held loaves of flaky crusted French bread, stacks of thin, delicate tortillas, plates of barbecued beef, and long red rolls of spicy sausages. But most of all, there were cheeses, for the Three Marys was a cheese-eating valley. There were yellow cheese and white cheese and curded cheese from cow's milk. 274. There was even a flat white cake of goat cheese from distant Linares, a delicacy too expensive for any but feast days. To set off this feast were bottles of beer floating in ice-filled tin tubs, and another table was covered with bottles of mezcal, of tequila, of maguey wine. All right, let's pause. Just write it down in 2B. What do you want to say about setting already? Why do you think our writer here is giving us so much description of setting? The quick answer, of course, is this is party time. We're having a great party. Everything is happy. All of a sudden, this young, really handsome stranger shows up. By the way, did you catch that one line? He wondered if anybody would recognize him, because if anybody recognized him, then he's in trouble. All right, here we go. Obviously, we're already starting to predict a little bit about what's up next, right? Here we go. Don Romeo Calderon thrust a glass of tequila into the stranger's hand. Drink, friend, to the prettiest girl in San Juan. As pretty as my fine fighting cock she is. <coughs> On her wedding day, she takes to her man, and by the blessed ribs, may she find him soon. The best fighter in my flock. Drink deep, friend. Even the rivers flow with wine. The Hidalgo man laughed and raised his glass high. May the earth be always fertile beneath her feet. Someone 
called to Don Romeo that more guests were arriving, and with a final delighted pat on the stranger's shoulder, the little man scurried away. As the young fellow smiled after his retreating host, his eyes caught and held another pair of eyes. Laughing black eyes set in a young girl's face. Uh-oh. The last time he had seen that face, it had been white and tense with rage, and the lips clenched tight to prevent an outgushing stream of angry words. That had been in February, and she had worn a white lace shawl over her hair. Now it was May, and a gardenia was a splash of white in the glossy, dark braids. The moonlight had mottled his face that February night, and he knew that she did not recognize him. He grinned impudently back at her, and her eyes widened, then slid sideways to one of the chaperones. The fan in her small hand snapped shut. She tapped its parchment tip against her mouth and slipped away to join the dancing couples in the front room. The gestures of a fan translate into a coded language on the frontier. The stranger raised one eyebrow as he interpreted the signal. But he did not move toward her at once. Instead, he inched slowly back against the table. No one was behind him, and his hands quickly unfastened the package he had been guarding so long. Then he nonchalantly walked into the front room. The girl was sitting close to a chaperone. As he came up to her, he swerved slightly toward the bushy-browed old lady. Your servant, senora. I kiss your hands and feet. The chaperone stared at him in astonishment. Such fine manners were not common to the town of San Juan Iglesias. Hey, you're a stranger, she said. I thought so. 275. But a stranger no longer, senora, now that I have met you. He bent over her so close she could smell the faint fragrance of talcum on his freshly shaven cheek. Will you dance the parada with me? This request startled her eyes into popping open beneath the heavy brows. So, my young rooster, would you flirt with me? Am I old enough to be your grandmother? Can you show me a prettier woman to flirt with in the Valley of the Three Marys? He asked audaciously. She grinned at him and turned toward the girl at her side. This young fool wants to meet you, my child. The girl blushed to the roots of her hair and shyly lowered her white lids. The old woman laughed aloud. Ah! Go out and dance, the two of you. A man clever enough to pat the sheep has a right to play with the lamb. The next moment, they had joined the circle of dancers, and Sarita was trying to control her laughter. Let's pause for a moment. Of course, you can jump to 3A. What's the text from your freshman year that immediately comes to mind in terms of guy meets girl on dance floor, walks up to her, and says, can I have a kiss? And she says, I would love to give you a kiss. And she puts out her hands her hand and says, you mean like kiss as in high five. And of course, Romeo says, yeah, yeah, kiss like this. And then he goes, can we let our lips do what our hands are doing? And she says, well, look, when our high five is like this, when you turn it like this, it looks like praying. She says, you mean, can we pray? Is that what you mean? Of course. Romeo and Juliet. So notice we're playing with a very old motif. You've seen it in movies. You can probably jot it down in 3A really quickly. That is to say, something has gone on between the two of these before, and now here he is, and we're going to obviously have to reckon with what happens next. You can already begin to kind of maybe make some predictions, or not. She is the worst dragon in San Juan, and how easily you won her. What is a dragon, he asked imperiously, when I long to dance with you. Ay, she retorted, you have a quick tongue. I think you are a dangerous man. In answer, he drew her closer to him, and he turned her toward the orchestra. As he reached the chief violinist, he called out, Play the Virgencita, the shy young maiden. The violinist's mouth opened in soundless surprise. The girl in his arms said sharply, You heard him, the Borrachita. The little drunken girl. With a relieved grin, the violinist tapped his music stand with his bow, and the music swung into the sad farewell of a man to his sweetheart. Farewell, my little drunken one. I must go to the capital to serve the master who makes me weep for my return. The stranger frowned down at her. Is this a joke, senorita? he asked coldly. 
No, she whispered, looking about her quickly to see if the incident had been observed. But the Virgencita is the favorite song of Hidalgo, a village on the other side of the mountains in the next valley. The people of Hidalgo and San Juan Iglesias do not speak. That is a stupid thing, said the man from Hidalgo as he swung her around in a large turn. Is not music free as air? Why should one town own the rights to a song? The girl shuddered slightly. Those people from Hidalgo, they are wicked monsters. Can you guess what they did not six months since? The man started to point out that the space of time from February to May was three months, but he thought it better not to appear too wise. Did these Hidalgo monsters frighten you, senorita? If they did, I personally will kill them all. She moved closer against him and tilted her face until her mouth was close to his ear. They attempted to steal the bones of Don Romulo Balderas. Is it possible? He made his eyes grow round and his lips purse up in disdain. Surely not that. Why, all the world knows that Don Romulo Balderas was the greatest historian in the entire republic. Every school child reads his books. Wise men from Quintana Roo to the Rio Bravo bow their heads in admiration to his name. What a wicked thing to do. He hoped his virtuous tone was not too virtuous for plausibility, but she did not seem to notice. It is true, in the night they came, three devils. Young devils, I hope. Young or old, who cares? They were devils. The blacksmith surprised them even as they were opening the grave. He raised such a shout that all of San Juan rushed to his aid, for they were fighting, I can tell you, especially one of them, their leader. And who was he? You have heard of him, doubtless. A proper wild one named Pepe Gonzalez. 277. To them. They had horses and got away, but one, I think, was hurt. The Hidalgo man twisted his mouth, remembering how Reuben, the candy maker, had ridden across the whitewashed line high on the canyon trail that marked the division between the three Marys and the Sabina sides of the mountains, and then had fallen in a faint from his saddle because his left arm was broken. There was no candy in Hidalgo for six weeks, and the entire Sabina's valleys resented that broken arm as fiercely as did Reuben. The stranger tightened his arm in reflexed anger about Sarita's waist, as she said, all the world knows that the men of Hidalgo are sons of the mountain witches. But even devils are shy of disturbing the honored dead, he said gravely. Don Romulo was born in our village, Hidalgo says. His bones belong to us. Well, anyone in the valley can tell you he died in San Juan Iglesias, and here his bones will stay. Is that not proper? Is that not right? To keep from answering, he guided her through an intricate dance pattern that led them past the patio door. Over her head, he could see two men and a woman staring with amazement at the open package on the table. 278. His eyes on the patio, he asked blandly, You say the leader was one Pepe Gonzalez? The name seems to have a familiar sound. But naturally, he has a talent. She tossed her head and stepped away from him as the music stopped. It was a dance of two paradas. He slipped his hand through her arm and guided her into place in the large oval of parading couples. Twice around the room and the orchestra would play again. A talent, he prompted, for doing the impossible. When all the world says a thing cannot be done, he does it to prove the world wrong. Why, he climbed to the top of the prow and not even the long-vanished Joaquin Castillo had ever climbed that mountain before. And this same Pepe caught a mountain lion with nothing to aid him but a rope and his two bare hands. He doesn't sound such a bad friend, protested the stranger, slipping his arm around her waist as the music began to play the merry song of the soap bubbles. Pretty bubbles of a thousand colors that ride on the wind and break as swiftly as a lover's heart. The events in the patio were claiming his attention. Little by little, he edged her closer to the door. 
The group at the table had considerably enlarged. There was a low murmur of excitement from the crowd. What has happened? asked Sarita, attracted by the noise. Mm, there seems to be something wrong at the table, he answered, while trying to peer over the heads of the people in front of him. Realizing that this might be the last moment of peace he would have that evening, he bent toward her. If I come back on Sunday, will you walk around the plaza with me? She was startled into exclaiming, I know. Please, just once around. And you think I'd walk more than once with you, senor, even if you were no stranger? In San Juan Iglesias, to walk around the plaza with a girl means a wedding. Ha! And you think that is common to San Juan alone? Even the devils of Hidalgo respect that law. He added hastily at her puzzled upward glance, and so they do in all the villages. To cover his lapse, he said softly, I don't even know your name. 279. A mischievous grin crinkled the corners of her eyes. Nor do I know your senor. Strangers do not often walk the streets of San Juan. Before he could answer, the chattering in the patio swelled to louder proportions. Don Romeo's voice lay on top like thick cream on milk. I tell you, it is a jewel <coughs> of a cheese. Such flavor, such texture, such whiteness. It is a jewel of a cheese. What has happened, Sarita asked of a woman at her elbow. A fine goat's cheese appeared as if by magic on the table. No one knows where it came from. Probably an extra one from Linares, snorted a fat bald man on the right. Linares never made such a cheese as this, said the woman decisively. Silence, roared Don Romeo. Old Dio Daniel would speak a word to us. A great hand of silence closed down over the mouths of the people. The girl was standing on tiptoe, trying vainly to see what was happening. She was hardly aware of the stranger's whispering voice, although she remembered the words that